In the past days, Sieroji has been speaking about lekana, this Pali word which means characteristic or mark or sign. And Sieroji mentioned that there are three kinds of lekana or characteristic. Sabhava lekana, Sankata lekana, and Samanya lekana. The Sabhava lekana is the individual characteristic that every bit of mind and matter has. All mind, all matter, all nama and rupa have an individual characteristic. And this is called sabhava lekana, or uh, natural characteristic. These bits of mind and matter, these, uh, this true nature has a beginning, a middle, and an end. Initially, something isn't there. It begins, it exists for a moment, and then it passes away. In Pali, this is called upada, arising, titi, a momentary existence, and banga, or uh, breaking down. So these are three periods of time, start, middle, and end. Everything that exists, that arises, has this characteristic of having a start, a middle, and an end. And this is how it appears to us. So when one is able to observe these sabhava lakana, these natural characteristics, uh, first one, first one sees their middle. When when one starts to be able to see these these things called true nature, the first thing that becomes apparent is the middle of it. And as our knowledge becomes stronger, we are we are able to see the beginning as well as the middle. But we're not able to see the end yet. Only when the knowledge becomes even stronger are we able to see how things come to an end. So we see, the, uh, we see how these phenomena come to an end and then we realize, oh, these things that are happening inside me, they, they end, they are not permanent. This knowledge arises. And this is the start of Vipassana knowledge, to be able to see the ending of things and to know that they are impermanent. So all mind and matter, all nama and rupa, are the same in this respect. There is nothing, none of them are permanent. Mind and matter are like a flash of lightning. If one wants to see, lightning, then one has to watch while it is happening. And when one does, one knows the light that it creates. One also knows that lightning functions to dispel darkness. This is what lightning does. And one also may know the form. Sometimes the lightning looks jagged, sometimes it looks curvy, wavy. So these are three things that become apparent about lightning. The light, that it dispels darkness, and then the form that it has, the shape that it makes in the sky. And when we see any one of these three, we can say that we know lightning. We know what lightning is like. And this is the same when we observe the phenomena, the mind and matter that, ex that happen inside our own being. When we watch them at the moment, the very moment that they arise, 
we may see their form or shape. We may see the position they're in, their manner. Um, and they, one may, we may see their true nature. These are three different aspects of the things that we see in us. So in order to see the true nature this, of, of phenomena, right at the moment of seeing, at the moment of hearing, smelling, tasting, touching, at the moment the abdomen rises or falls, at the moment of lifting, moving or placing the foot, at, at the moment of bending or stretching, at the moment of looking forward, looking backward, at the moment of blinking or opening and closing the eyes. If we observe at the very moment these things happen, we can know true nature. At the start, we should have the intention, we should have the aim to try not to miss anything that happens in our being. We have that aim. At the start, we can't do it. But by setting that aim, we are able to do more and more and more. And our ability to observe becomes amazingly good because we establish this aim at the start of trying not to miss anything that happens. So the teachers do not ask the yogis coming here from abroad to do anything impossible. It is possible to be able to catch all the different things that happen inside one. This is the teaching of the Buddha that we use uh, to help us do this. As Mahasi Sayadaw instructed. And this help, the help that we get from this teaching in this work is very, very valuable. So one should understand the value that these instructions give, understand the benefit that comes from the practice, and therefore undertake it in a, a manner of respect and meticulous care. Um, not just try, not just, um, not just by appearance, but really trying to um, do the work. So. When yogis behave in this way, uh, with respect and care towards the practice, then it is worthwhile for Sayadawji to give his help. To know what is really happening in one's body. At first, it's difficult to pick things out. One can't just focus in on things. So one has to look at the form of things and the manner, the form and the manner or position some part of the body is in is what we can see, what we can see easily. So an analogy is, say, on the table there's a piece of food and that food has some flavor. It may be sweet or sour, spicy. It might be uh, bland, salty, bitter. But we can't just look at the food and guess what the flavor is. If we want to know the flavor that's in the food, we have to put the piece of food in our mouth. And then we have to chew and when the flavor reaches the tongue, then we know the flavor of the food. Or if we're drinking a cup of something, uh, when we drink, then we know the taste that that liquid has. So taste is dependent upon a place. Taste exists somewhere. It's, it, you can't separate it out, for example, from the liquid that is flavored or the piece of food that is flavored. You can't separate out taste as a, the flavor as a separate thing. 
it's um, it's with located within a place so that's what we look at when we practice when we meditate we're trying to observe true nature but we have to observe where it is located so for example if we're observing what happens when we blink the eye what happens when the eyes open and close the eyes why they blink is because the, of the dryness that starts to occur on the eye and the uncomfortable feeling and then when the, bl the blinking happens there's relief so um, we have to focus on the area of the eye in order to observe these qualities that happen the same thing when we try to watch the rising and the falling of the abdomen that means while the um, we put our attention on the abdomen and while it rises and falls we observe that so what we see mostly at first is the shape or we see the position that the abdomen is of being expanded or contracted so at first we can't separate out the true nature from the form of the place where the true nature is happening or the manner but this true nature is like the flavor in, a, in food and sabhava true nature is also called sarasa um, it's the, how it's like the flavor in food is that you can't separate out the, the true nature the individual characteristics from the place where they're happening the same way the flavor can't be pulled out and pointed to as something uh, separate from the food so at the start of the practice what we see mostly is the form the shape of things and the manner of them for example uh, we observe the abdomen and when the abdomen rises or expands we note it as rising when it falls back down again we note it as falling when we bend our arm we note that as bending we put our attention on the bending and note it as bending when we stretch out our arm again we put our attention on this on the arm and and label it as stretching lift in walking lifting the foot moving it forward placing it um, at that time at the time we perform any action just like there are flavors in a bit of food that we eat there are also individual things like flavor to be tasted in the actions that we perform so in order to observe we have to make effort to observe the thing that we're trying to watch and that means to push the mind so that it gets to the object that we're trying to watch and we also have to aim we have to make aim so that the mind is focused properly if we have these two qualities of making effort to observe the object and aim, trying to also aim the mind then mindfulness or awareness sati will arise and following on sati there will be concentration or samadhi and when these qualities become well developed and they have energy then we will start to taste or experience the individual or know the true nature that happens inside of us let's say for example that there's an apple in front of us and we know that apples are sweet and they're cold okay but we we know this but we don't know it in a practical way it's just what we think when we see the apple before we actually taste it so we don't really know what that apple is like truly so we bite into it and chew and then coldness we feel coldness on the tongue or the sweet flavor on the tongue 
And when we chew carefully and put our attention on the mouth where the apple is being chewed, then we know the taste. We know it's sweet or sour or cold. And we know this in a direct way for ourselves. So then, tasting it in this way, we know the taste of the apple. And meditation is like this. So it's not imagining what is it happening inside us, not reflecting on it, but it's observing what arises in our body. So we try to observe whatever arises in our body and then we gain practical knowledge of what it's like. So whatever happens, whatever we're watching inside of us, whatever tr we're trying to observe, we use a label. So when there's seeing happening, we note it as seeing. Or hearing, we note that as hearing. When we observe, say for example, the action, action of going from standing to sitting down. In that process, there's the intention to sit down that occurs in a series. And there's also a series of, of, of gradually sitting down, a series of physical actions that occur. The intention to sit down and the sitting down, the mind and the matter occur together as pairs in the process of sitting down. If we think during the process of sitting down, we're not going to be able to know what is happening in ourselves at that moment. So we have to put aside thinking. We have to push it aside and make effort in order to observe what is happening in our body at the moment we go from standing to sitting down. So we make the effort to put our mind on the body at that moment, and we also try to aim so that the mind has the object in focus. And then we look. Okay. When we look in that way, having made effort to observe and aim, aiming the mind, then our mind does not go anywhere else. And in that moment, the mind is clean. So what, with what, whatever is being observed, when we observe in that way, there won't be any reaction to the object that is being observed. There won't be any going along with it. There won't be any rejecting it. When we go along, when we give in to, when we go along with something that we like, that's basically greed or loba. When we reject things that we don't like, that's anger or dosa. And when we're just observing what is happening, we're not following either of those tendencies. We're free of those. So if you just think about this, you can understand that this is true. When the object arises, we make effort to observe it and we aim the mind so that it's focused because the mind is staying there then greed and anger these mental defilements don't have a chance to arise the path for them to uh, arise is closed so we can calculate for ourselves just how valuable this is when one doesn't observe what is happening then these tendencies will arise. The tendency to go along with what we like, or the tendency to reject what we don't like. This is basically greed and anger. And in any moment when we're not observing with aim and effort, then there will be delusion, confusion about what is there. One won't know. So, sometimes this confusion occurs together with greed. Sometimes occurs, it occurs together with anger. And this is how most people just uh, spend all their time with these, either, either going along with things or rejecting them. 
That's the way most people spend their time. So if the mind is not clean, then energy won't be, be, won't be built. Instead, the energy of the mind will be weakening. So one should understand the value of this practice and therefore value it. For people who don't know how to prevent or dispel greed and anger from, from their being, for people like that, most of their waking hours, from the moment they wake up until they fall asleep, it's either anger or greed happening moment after moment. And that's because not observing, not knowing, defilements come in. When we don't make effort to observe what is happening in us at the moment, when we don't aim our mind so that our observation is accurate, then mental defilements can come into our mind. And whenever defilements are present, there, are, there is always confusion, not knowing. And there will always be the quality of not being disgusted by unwholesomeness. This attitude is similar to, um, it's like one is not disgusted by unwholesomeness in the same way that uh, one might not be disgusted by feces. So this is, when one's mind is uh, unclean, then one lacks this disgust towards unwholesomeness. And one also is not afraid of unwholesomeness. Um, just like not being afraid to pick up a red hot iron burning ball. It's natural to feel fear, but when a person's mind is unwholesome, they don't have that fear regarding unwholesomeness. And also the mind will be scattered. So these four qualities always arise when the mind is not clean. Confusion, uh, lack of shame, lack of fear regarding wrongdoing, and the scattered mind. And if one calculates, uh, those who just let their mind go where it wants to go without applying any method for controlling their minds, or people who know that there's a method but don't use it, or don't use it systematically, then this is what is happening. These unwholesome qualities are arising. But on the other hand, observing and knowing defilements come clean. So when um, in every second that one is working to observe what is happening at the moment, then the mind is becoming clean. And this is something that one should value. If one takes care not to miss, if one has the aim that I'm not gonna miss anything, then as one gains skill in the practice, one will know very clearly uh, what one is observing and one will know also if one misses anything, one will know right away. And sometimes one can even catch oneself before one misses and to observe an object. So this is why Sayadaji has been encouraging the yogis to understand what the benefits are of the practice and therefore value this work. Sayadaji wants all of you to generate this valuable Dhamma in every second of the time within yourselves. Sayadaji wants to speak about something that he's spoken about, which is the action, how to observe in the moment of going from standing to sitting down for the benefit of new yogis. 
So when we're about to sit down, in sitting down, there's a series of intentions to sit down. And this causes a series of sitting down process, sitting physicality. These occur uh, one by one and as they are connected with each other. This intention to sit down and the physical actions that occur bit by bit of sitting down. And if one observes carefully, uh, just as the body goes down bit by bit, as we're going from changing the posture from standing to sitting, so that the mind falls on the, on the posture of sitting down. The mind sticks with that sitting down posture. And in that moment, the mind is clean. It doesn't uh, go anywhere else. It stays right there with the sitting down process. So this is very beneficial. And from time to time during that process of observing the sitting down, when one's mind falls or connects with the uh, stiffness, some stiffness, then one knows stiffness. When one's mind falls on tension, then one knows tension. When one, one's mind falls on heaviness, one knows heaviness. And when it becomes very stiff or very tense or very heavy, then there's discomfort also that one, one knows these things. So one can also know from time to time the wanting to sit down, the intention to sit down that is happening in the mind. So if one observes carefully at the time of going from standing to sitting, then one will know one of these things. One won't know them all at the same time. One will know just what is apparent at that moment. So as when we're chewing a piece of food, we chew it and sometimes we know the sweet taste. Sometimes we know a sour taste. Sometimes we know that it is cold. So similarly, when we're observing something, there are various things, but one doesn't know all of them at the same time. When one observes, then one observes at time, from time to time, there's stiffness, or there's tension, or there's heaviness, or there's the intention to sit down. One knows these different things one at a time. And these things are like flavors. So if we're chewing a piece of food that has two kinds of flavors in it, we're only going to know one of those flavors at any given time. So we should understand um, that in the moment in the moment of sitting, what sits is the body. Intention is mind. There's not a woman. There's not a man. There's not a being, a human there. There's just body and mind. And when they arise, we should observe them, observe the mind and matter with aim and effort. So when we look, when we look applying our aim and effort, then one will see. So one will see that in this moment of sitting down, there's just mind and matter. There's just nama and rupa. There's no self inside there. There's no soul inside there. It's just mind and matter. So when we observe and see, then we dispel the idea that there's some being inside of us. So we should try to observe so that we can see clearly 
the mind and the matter that is in us. So as now, with this method of Satipatthana, if one performs the action of going from standing to sitting down as though one were a sick person, doing it slowly and observing with art and effort and accurate aim, then one will see that there is a series of intentions to sit down, followed by a series of physical actions of sitting down. And it's also not something that happens through the command or the act of a powerful being. This sitting down happens because there's a series of intentions to sit down. And this series brings about a series of physical actions that is sitting down. So it is not causeless. It's not without a cause. So one comes to see that this is how things happen. When we sit down, it's because there's a cause. The mental, the intention, the mind, creates the result of the physical action. And it's because the, the intention to sit causes sitting down and not something else. The cause and the effect are related. So then one, when, un, when one understands this, when one, one sees this, then how can one find any creator in all this? Because what arises, what we experience, is just cause and effect. So when one observes what happens in oneself like this, and one sees how these actions are occurring just as cause and effect, will there be any doubt about how things happen? So one will understand, oh, sitting down happens because there's the intention to sit down. That's why. So when one understands how cause and effect work, then one feels very satisfied and one's knowledge builds, one's knowledge blossoms. So uh, when we have a car, we keep the engine running. When the engine is running, then the battery gets charged. And then the battery becomes full, uh, the charge is full, and then we're able to use it. We can turn on the lights uh, even when the car is not running. So. This too, in the practice, uh, in the battery of our life, we want to be always putting energy into our battery so that then we can turn on the lights and see. So when we observe, and when we try to, um, when we make effort in the practice to observe our actions, to observe what is happening every moment, we can come to see cause and effect very, very clearly. So when we make strong effort and our aim is accurate, then our knowledge becomes very clear. If we stop our awareness. If we stop our observation, then it's like letting our car sit without running it. The battery can lose its charge and it can be hard to get the engine started again. So we should always try to keep the um, battery charged. We should always try to keep our observation active just like always trying to keep our car running so that our battery has a good charge. The yogis have to always apply effort to observe and aim accurately. And this is what keeps our, our mental energy strong to be a try 
going to do this every second of the time. So if our um, if we keep our energy running like this, the battery gets charged automatically. We don't need to do any extra work to have our battery charged as long as the engine is running. So Sirauji urges the yogis to practice in this way, to take um, meticulous care with applying the, the practice, be respectful towards the practice, so that your time here will be beneficial. So whenever, and it's not just, uh, he's talked about standing, going from standing to sitting down, but every single action should be applied, uh, should be observed with this same application of energy, effort, and aiming. So when, when one bends and stretches, when one goes from uh, sitting to standing up, all things are supposed to be uh, done with our awareness of them, with, with, ener with effort used to uh, observe what is it we're doing at the moment. And when, we, when our mental energy builds so that we observe more and more, then we will know not just we'll know what we've noted, but we'll know what we've missed, too. So, Sierraji urges all of you to practice in such a way that whatever time you have here uh, will bring you a lot of benefit.